It's now time to start finding your seats for Sabbath services. May I have your attention, please? Shabbat Shalom, everyone. My name is Son of Ishmael and Avaya Hawkins, and I'd like to serve you forever as a priest starting very soon. It's a privilege and honor to present to you the sons and daughters of Ishmael now entering the sanctuary. It's a privilege and honor to present our first speaker, son of Ishmael, Deacon Melchizedek Hawkins. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. You may be seated. May the peace of Yahweh be with each and every one of you. Now, today I'd like to speak on the uh, subject of unity in Yahweh's laws. Now, uh, I looked up the word unity, and unity, it means the state of being one or united, oneness, single harmony, agreement, a unified group or body. Now, we can be in unity with the house of Yahweh, or we could be in unity with the kingdom of Satan. And uh, if we could be turning over to Matithia, but uh, we could see how Yahshua was in unity with the house of Yahweh. And in Matithia, chapter 4, and uh, it's found on page 730, but Matithia, chapter 4, and we start off here on verse 2, and it's talking about Yahshua, and it says, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards he was hungry. So when the tempter came to him, she said, If you are the son of Yahweh, command these stones to be turned to bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of Yahweh. Then the devil took him up into the holy city and into the uh, pinnacle of the sacred precincts of the house of Yahweh, and said to him, If you are the son of Yahweh, throw yourself down. For it is written, For he will give uh, his Malachim charge concerning you to keep you in all your ways. They will bear up their hands if you should strike your foot against the stone. Then Yahshua said to her, It is also written, You must not test Yahweh your father. Again, the devil took him up into an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the magnificence of them, and said to him, I will give you all these things if you fall down and worship me. Then Yahshua said to her, You get away from me, Satan, for it is written, Yahweh your father you must reverence, and him only you must serve. And uh, then the devil left him in verse 11. But uh, you have to, we have to remember that tests and trials will come, but we have to remember to be brave. And uh, in the 6th book of Israel, chapter 4, verse 10, um, it says here, uh, it says, verse 8, Do not fear. If it ended right here, it, it, you could set your mind to be brave and then change it in a few seconds. You have to get the rest of what is being taught in the Holy Scriptures. You know how to stand up against evil, first off. You have to know that you're standing for and believing in the laws of Yahweh and the prophecies of the kingdom of Yahweh. Therefore, you have to listen. You have to listen and get these scriptures in your mind in order to stand up and be strong. You, if, you trust, if you trust enough in Yahweh, you know what is coming and why it is coming. Then you won't be afraid. And uh, also in the seventh book of Israel, part one, it says, go over to Yerimia uh, now. It's chapter 16, verse 46. And it says, go over to Yerimia now. Yerimia, the 23rd chapter. And it says, Yerimia 23. Here's another one. One of the main prophets of Yahweh. One of the main prophets in the Holy Scriptures. I think Daniel is a supreme prophet. He's been classified as a minor prophet. But I think he's one of the supreme prophets that spoke the laws of Yahweh and was brave enough to stand up in spite of the threat of death and say, you're sinning, you need to stop. Stop breaking the laws of Yahweh. You need to start calling upon his name. It takes a lot, a lot of grit today. True grit, someone called it. Now grit, I looked it up in the dictionary, and it means courage and determination. And... The Peaceful Solution Character Education Program 
defines courage as the act of doing what needs to be done even when you are afraid. And the peaceful solution also talks about standing up for what is right even whenever you're the only one left standing. And this can be an example of courage. And the prophets, they had this, uh, they had this character trait. If we go over to the book of Daniel, book of Daniel, it's Daniel chapter 3, and it's found on page 673. And, but if we go over to verse 10, it says, You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, paltry, and every kind of music must fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship, he is to be thrown into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Now there are certain Hebrews whom you've set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods, nor do they worship the golden image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was enraged and fury and commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought to, to him. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke and said to him, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if you are prepared to fall down and worship the image which I have set up at the time that you hear the set, the sound of the cornet, flute, heart, uh, paltry, and every kind of music, then it will be well with you. But if you refuse to worship, you will be thrown into the midst of the burning fiery furnace in the same hour. And what god el is it that will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered King Nebuchadnezzar and said, There is no need for us to answer you cautiously in this matter. If we are thrown into the burning fiery furnace... Our Father, whom we serve, is able to deliver us, and may he deliver us from your hands, O King. But if he will not, may it also be known to you, O King, that we will not serve your gods, Elohim, nor worship the golden image which you have set up. And uh, so you can see there how they had courage. They were determined to keep Yahweh's laws. Even under pressure, they kept Yahweh's laws. Now, uh, in conclusion, I would like to leave you with a quote. From the seventh book of Israel, part two, chapter 21, verse 28. It says, but what if they, if you were raided? Think on this. Be prepared for what, uh, what you're going to do if it takes place. I remember reading where the ap apostles were, in fact, I read you in, were in the scriptures where one apostle was actually led down by his fellow members out of a window by a rope so he could escape. Would you be that brave, you know? I would, I, if I had to leave the house of Yahweh, I would rather die than to leave the house of Yahweh. And uh, pastor, don't, don't ever get this mixed up in your mind. Don't ever think, don't think that someone's going to commit suicide. Pastor's talking about he's, he would rather stand in his place. He wants to stand in his place forever. Just like the prophets, they were persecuted to death. And they would stay, and they stayed in the house of Yahweh forever. And um, in conclusion, I'd like to say that we must be in unity for Yahweh's protection. Very soon we will want Yahweh's protection. So with that, if, uh, let us all come into unity today. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Praise Yahweh. Praise Yahweh for being at the great feast of tabernacles. Praise Yahweh. Praise Yahweh. This morning we're going to have a presentation by both the sons and daughters of Israel Abel. So I'll ask for everyone to please be seated. And now turn it over to the daughters of Israel Abel for their presentation.
written by the daughters of Israel Abel. Praise Yahweh. So at this time, we will have the sons of Israel Abel do their presentation. And now is my honor to present to you the great son of Israel, Yeshrin Hawkins. I'm going to start off with some news about unity. It's hope to Americans avoid a superficial quest for unity.
He's, uh, this is in Philadelphia, standing before this city, a clock independence hall. Pope Francis giving a ringing endorsement of religious freedom and immigration on Sunday. I mean, Saturday, urging his American hosts to avoid a superficial quest for unity. Now, he's saying that he doesn't want no one to go by fake unity. He's the one that has fake unity. Pope Francis' unity is fake. We have to be in order to... Uh, to stay in Yahweh's house and obey the law so that we don't get cut off from Yahweh. Unity equals obedience. Obedience to Yahweh's laws. When we are obedient to Yahweh's laws, it automatically separates us from the world. First Yachman 3 verse 10 on page 965. Now it says, In this the throne of Yahweh and the throne of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice his righteousness is not of Yahweh, and he does not love his neighbor. Who are these children who practice his righteousness? Matthew 18, verse 3, on page 745. And says, and said truly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become like their children, you will not enter into the kingdom of Yahweh. Mm-hmm. Yahweh's children are humble like a little child. They seek after his guidance and instruction, which comes after his administration, who teaches all Yahweh's laws. If you are Yahweh's children, then you are in full agreement that Yahweh's laws work you will put every effort to doing uh, every effort to practicing all his laws. We can turn over to Yachin on seventeen verse twenty three on page eight hundred and thirty five. And it says I in them and you in me, so that they may be made perfect in unity, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Yahshua, uh, in conclusion, I'd like to say, Yahshua is humble like a little child. He came into unity with with Yahweh through obedience. Let us be humble like Yahshua and come into unity with Yahweh. And if you all please stand, I would like to turn it over to to, to the great son of Israel, Bill Hawkins. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. You may be seated. May the peace of Yahweh be with each and every one of you. My title today is Being in Unity and Agreement. Now this feast we can show Yahweh that we are in unity with Him by eating under the sukkah. In the first book of Yeshua, chapter 17, verse 5, it says, Don't forget to eat under the sukkah. We have several scattered around here throughout the campground to understand. Don't forget to fulfill that law. Try to imagine living in this for seven days or 40 years. This is just one of the things that our forefathers went through in bringing you this book that that, that we are now reading from. If you dwell in it for even a minute, eat under it. Drink something under it. You can fulfill the law. Don't just get under there, take a bite, and rush off. Try to imagine what what went on and, and live it in your heart. 
Following the examples of the holy men and women of old brings us into unity with Yahweh. Please turn to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. On page 918. Ephesians 4, and we'll look at verse 13. Until we all come to the same unity of the faith, the same knowledge the Son of Yahweh has unto a perfect man, into, unto the measure and stature of performance, perfection of Messiah. Unity isn't agreeing one moment, then totally disagreeing the next. Satan's workers will come to you and say, This isn't the place of salvation, or You don't have to keep those old laws. Or, I'm really the Messiah. But don't fall for it. Stay in unity and agreement with Yahweh, Yahshua, Yishua Hawkins, and the house of Yahweh. Praise Yahweh. Turn to Romans. Romans 16. And let's look at verse... 17. Now I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause division, divisions, offenses, contrary to the teaching which you have learned, and avoid them. For those who do such do not serve our King Yahshua Messiah, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech, deceive the minds of the simple. Turn back a, page, a couple pages to 882, or Romans 12, and let's look at verse 14. One. Therefore, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of Yahweh, that you present y your bodies as living sacrifices, holy, acceptable to Yahweh, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to the pattern of the world, but be transferred by the renewing of your mind, that you may be able to test and prove what is righteous and acceptable and, the, and perfect will of, of Yahweh. Look down to verse 16. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate yourselves with the humble. Do not be wise in your own conceits. Now, in conclusion, stay in complete unity, which is agreement, with Yahweh, Yahshua, Yeshua Hawkins, and the house of Yahweh. And don't let anyone deceive you. And you will receive the promise of protection from Yahweh. Turn to Isaiah. Isaiah 4. And let's look at verse 5. Yahweh will create over every dwelling place of Mount Zion, over those whom he gathers there, a cloud and smoke by day, and the shining of a flaming sword by night. For all over their glory, Yahweh will create a defense. Because there on Mount Zion will be a tabernacle for his shadow, and that day... From the heat for a place of refuge and a covert from, from storm and rain. And y'all, I bless your understanding. Y'all please stand. Turn it over to the great Gahan Shaul. Praise Yahweh. Praise Yahweh. Shabbat Shalom. Welcome home, saints. Praise Yahweh. I tell you, that's a two hard acts to follow right there. But I'll try my best here if you'll all be seated. We're going to continue along the same theme here, brothers and sisters. If you'll be turning over to Leviticus 23. There's so much for us to learn this feast, brothers and sisters. I want to encourage everyone, don't miss any part of it. Don't miss these classes, the workshops. Don't miss any service because this is why we're here is to learn how to come into this complete and perfect unity with Yahweh. And there's so much to understand about this unity, but we're going to touch a little bit on it and exactly what this particular feast here that we're celebrating right now teaches us about this unity. Now, if you look at Leviticus 23 and 42... It says, and you shall live in booths for seven days, all who are native-born children of Israel, 
uh, shall live in booths. And we are. We are native born. We were either born from the preaching, you know, either the seed or the direct offspring. We all fall into that category. In order that your generations, and he's talking specifically about this last generation, the end of the age, the end of the ages. This is us, brethren, that this was done for and written for so that we could learn this unity. In order that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to live in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of sin. He brought them out of the, the sin system, the Nimrod system, which was in Egypt. And remember, Egypt, if you'll go back to the Mark of the Beast, number one, and it shows all seven of the beastly systems, there Egypt was the first. This was the first. The Coptics. And this became the Catholics. The locations changed. The names changed. But the religion that they came up against, the rebellion against Yahweh, was always the same. They tried to fool the people by changing the name. Oh, we'll be Catholic now. But it's the same religion, the same practices. But And Yahweh has brought us out of this land of Egypt, here this land of sin, this life lifestyle of sin, and he's making us to dwell in temporary dwellings. Yes, this is a temporary life that we have here on this earth right now that, that uh, is pictured by these sukkahs, these tabernacles. Now, the tabernacle, just real quick, if you'll turn over to Psalm 27, here in verse 5, it, it does show Yahweh's protection. And yes, we are going to desperately need Yahweh's protection here, and we already have a bit of it, but when these wars kick off, you're really going to start to appreciate coming out of Egypt and the fact that this life is temporary. And you'll understand it more. But look in verse 5, in the time of trouble, and this is the worst time of trouble. There never was a worse time of trouble until now. All right, and it's going to get worse even. You will hide us in your pavilion or tabernacle or sukkah or booth. All means the same thing. In your house, in the secret place, you will hide us. You will set us high upon a rock right there. And there's tons of prophecies with that. Turn over to Hebrews 11. But what I want us to see today, and we really got to get this in our mind, you know, with the uh, increase in technology and the advertising and the marketing that's put forth and, and all the merchandise. And remember in Revelations about that merchandise, you know, it's easy to forget that this is a temporary life. When the cares of this world come upon you, you know, and, and the trials and tribulations Remember about the three out of four and the deceitfulness of riches and so forth that makes you forget what a temporary world and a temporary life this is. But this is what Yahweh's trying to show us here. And this is what our forefathers who actually came out of Egypt and actually lived in these booths that they made, you know, very temporary. More, They would look at a mobile home which we look at as a very temporary dwelling, they would look at that as a palace, you know, compared to the uh, sukkahs. Try, think of living, not just eating and drinking under the sukkah, but actually living there. You know, you'd be really be on display for the neighbors then, wouldn't you? <laughs> but, but in Hebrews 11, let's look at verse 8 and see what our forefathers did. We'll look at Abraham here and remember this with Abraham here was before they even went down into Egypt, the 12 tribes. By the faith, Abraham had the faith. He had, and it's testified in Genesis 26, Abraham kept my law, statutes, and judgments. It's not like he had just some idea or maybe one or two, and because it wasn't given until Moshe's day, Abel had the whole thing and preserved it in writing, and, Mo and Noah had it on the ark, remember. Well, when, when he was called to uh, go out into a place, I wonder what place that was, 
which he would afterwards receive for an inheritance. Yes, this is what Yahweh wants to give us. Like King David said, I will dwell in the house of Yahweh, with, pictured by this tabernacle or booth, forever. That'll be his inheritance. Obeyed. Abraham was in complete unity. Obeying. Now, just like we're obeying here this day and showing Yahweh our unity. And he went out not knowing where he was going. You know, <laughs> you hear so many stories when people leave out. And I remember reading in the, uh, you know, some people would comment this in the old feast guide. It said, 10 beautiful acres of campground. And there was like one or two mesquite trees there. Of course, they didn't realize it was the most beautiful. Not according to man's standards, maybe. But according to Yahweh's standards, because of what was taught there. It is and it was and is the most beautiful place. But not knowing where he was going. He didn't know every detail of every law and weigh it out in his mind. Well, do I really want to do that? Before he made his vow to Yahweh that he would be obedient, just like us at baptism. By faith he sojourned in a land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tents. Tents, temporary dwellings, with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which has foundations, real foundations. Not steel and concrete that's going to get blown away. I don't care how thick they make the concrete, the bombs are bigger. All right? There's only one foundation that's going to survive, and it's pictured by a lowly sukkah. Four posts in the ground and some branches on the top. Whose builder and maker is Yahweh. And then look down at uh, 13. All these have died in the faith, not having received the promises. Notice that. We haven't received the promises yet. Remember, they without us will not be made perfect. So don't sit here and think, well, if I don't get this by this time, you know, well, that's what Yahweh wants to know if you're going to stick with it. And all of them went to their death in old, old ages back then, not having received the promise. But notice, having seen them afar off, and we see them in writing. We see them afar off, not like through a telescope or something. We see it in our mind's eye by reading, by hearing and by reading. We believe without seeing. And we're convinced of them. They were convinced of them. Now these are our examples. And embraced them. Think of that. They embraced it wholeheartedly, putting all their trust in it, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. And so are we. Why would we be any less so when Yahweh has promised us the greatest positions, but the greatest test as well, okay, in this short time? For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they'd been thinking of the country which they had left, they would have the opportunity to return. But now they long for a better kingdom that is a heavenly. Therefore, Yahweh is not ashamed to be called their father, for he has prepared a city for them. And that's what we have in store if we'll get our minds realizing that this is only temporary. As uh, Kepha wrote in 2 Kepha 1, 13, he says, you know, he talks about his body. He says, yes, I think it is proper as long as I am in this tabernacle, talking about his own body, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing shortly that I must put off my tabernacle, even his own body. We know these are not permanent. Yahweh is going to change us. We're either going to die and be resurrected or we're going to be changed. But this body, the way it is now, is going to be different, much much different, brothers. It's going to be amazing. Just being in the bodies Yahweh has in store for us will be mind-blowing. But because of this, we're told, in turn to 1 Yachanon 2, 1 Yachanon 2 on 964, 
do not, in verse 15, do not love the world, nor the things that are in it. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And we're going to see what is that love of the Father. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, it's all lust and the pride of life. You see it everywhere, this pride that wells up and thinking that they're permanent fixtures on this earth and that this very lifestyle they have is permanent is not of the Father. These attitudes are not of the Father, that, but is of the world. And the world passes away with the lust that is in it. But he who does the will of Yahweh abides forever. Yeah, I wanted to look at this here in First Kepha 4, if you'll turn over to 959 here. You know, because this is a very temporary world. It passes away, as Yachanan just said. It's, that's a, a lot contained in that passing away. It's going to pass away with a big bang. All right? It's, and that's not a big bang theory either. If you look at Matthew 24, Revelation 9, and so forth, this, these nuclear wars are no joke. But it's all summed up in there. And also in Kepha's writings there about the elements burning. The very elements, the air, the land, it's going to ignite and catch fire. But he says, um, Yahshua then having suffered on your behalf, that you yourselves might be armed because of his suffering. And we'll see about how we can uh, join in with this here. And cease from sin. Remember, the, the sin no more. Sin never again. Okay? The pastor's been trying to drive that in their minds. In order to live... For the rest of the time, the rest of the time, which is very short, no longer by human passions, but by the will of Yahweh. Okay, so remember, if it's not forever, we don't want it. All right, and so let's see what the love of the Father is. Turn over to Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy 6 here. Now, we see in verse 4, again, about unity. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is your Father, Yahweh is one. He's a unity. He's unified. And He wants us to be in that same unity. That's what it means to be made into the image and likeness. So how do we do this? Look at the very next verse. And you must love Yahweh your Father with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your might. And these laws which I command you this day must be in your heart. Notice he just didn't say on your lips, which he does go into the, the teaching next. But they've got to be in our heart. All of our heart, soul, and might. That's what it takes to be in unity. That's how we become in unity. It's not two separate things. Well, this guy's in unity. This guy has unity with Yahweh. Well, this guy over here, though, he's love. He's got love. It's not separated. It's all one and the same thing. You can't have one without the other. You know, the, how can you love Yahweh if you're not in full agreement with Him, in unity with Him? That wouldn't even make sense. And how could you be in unity with Yahweh if you didn't love Him and His laws? It doesn't add up, does it? You know, they, there's no way you can have one uh, without the other. And turn over to 1st Yachanan 4, because if we love Yahweh, then we must, by definition, in 1st Yachanan 4, love our neighbor as ourself. Correct? That's the second greatest commandment. The first is loving Yahweh with all of our heart, soul, and might. But look at, uh, let me see where I want to go, uh, it talks in verse 17, uh, it, it talks about how, um, how as he is, so are we to become in this world. That there's no fear in love. He who fears is not made perfect in love. Well, it says we love him because he first loved us. If anyone says I love Yahweh and hates his brother, he's a liar. You can't even separate the first and second greatest commandments in any way. You can't have one without the other. 
For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love Yahweh whom he has not seen? And we're going to take that a step further here. Uh, for this is, and look down at 5, uh, uh, 3. Uh, for this is the love of Yahweh, that we keep his law, and his law is not grievous. Yahweh's law teaches us how do we show love to Yahweh, and how do we show love to our neighbor to our brothers and sisters, okay? And brothers and sisters, we just started out this year one of the biggest ways that we show true love to Yahweh and to our brothers, all right? What better way to show Yahweh we love our neighbor as ourselves than by showing love to the ones that we haven't even seen yet? Yachanan wrote about loving the brother we can see, but how about let's take that a step further and let's show love to those we haven't met yet. You think we could do that? Yes. Praise Yahweh. Yahshua did it. If you'll turn over to Romans, Romans 5, in verse 7, now it is an extraordinary thing for anyone, that's on page 877, for anyone to die for a righteous man. Yet maybe for a kind man, some would even dare to die. But Yahweh demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Messiah died for us. All right, think of the love. Now we can join in and partake of that love and get draw closer into unity than ever before by what Yahweh has set up in his law and timetable for us. Can anybody guess what that is? Third ties. That's right. Third ties. This is how we show love for those we have not met yet. In getting this word out, this message shows love. And I just want to clear up because I know there's a lot of questions and scenarios here uh, uh, about uh, about third ties, and well, do I pay it on this or do I pay it on that? And I want everyone, please, if you got your pens and pencils handy, there's two words, well, three actually, I want you to write down. Receive or, O-R, earn it. So third tithe year began the Day of Atonement. If you, anything you receive... After Day of Atonement, doesn't matter if you earned it 10 years ago, three months ago, you did the work last week, whatever. If you receive it during third tithe year, you pay third tithes. You owe Yahweh. It belongs to Yahweh. Or if you earn it during third tithe year. Now, this is getting toward next year, and we'll remind everyone at the end of next, you know, at the end of this year. Uh, next day of atonement, if you earn it before third tithe year ends, then you still owe third tithes, even though the day of atonement passes. But we'll get to that part. But right now, anything you receive from the day of atonement onward till the next day of atonement, you owe third tithes. Is that clear as mud? <laughs> Praise Yahweh. <laughs> All right, now... You know, uh, the Apostle Shaul, let's look at Timothy, because speaking of this temporary body and realizing, you know, about possessions and so on and the merchandise, you know, the merchandise of this world has gone up a thousand times in price and it's gone down in value a thousand times. It's worthless. It breaks. They have the best minds, the best minds of science have all gotten together to make sure that thing you just bought breaks right after the warranty goes out. And believe me, they test them, they drop them, you know, they kick them around, they do everything just so that they can know it. it's going to break as soon as that warranty goes out. It's junk. And that alone ought to tell you how temporary. But in, uh, oh, it's 1 Timothy 6. He says there in verse 6, Holiness with contentment is great gain. And verse 8, Having food and clothing, let us be content with these. And I'll tell you, food you got to have clothing to cover your body, of course, especially with even winter coming up here. 
And food, I'll tell you, a few things bring the satisfaction that a double meat, double pepper jack cheeseburger brings. And if you don't believe me, have one this feast, okay? But even with that, you know, a couple hours later, you're hungry again, right? Well, I want to show you some food here that will satisfy you forever. And we now have the 14th book of Israel, part 2, Sin Never Again. And pastor, this is your copy here. And we have, I just want to tell you, we have an awesome team of women and men who have dedicated their lives to getting this food that lasts forever. And uh, I also, you know, include the physical food with that, because without that, you couldn't get this other food out, okay? And, and an awesome team that is, is bent and, and determined to feed the people of Yahweh with this food that will last forever. And I want to go over a few verses here. Go back in time, do a little time traveling here. Back to the Going On to Perfection series. And Pastor gave an awesome sermon. And it's not like we're there yet, right? We're still going on to perfection. This book, this series, this work of getting us to perfection hasn't ended yet. It's not like, well, we're in perfection now. Well, now we've got to get into unity, you know? Because we made, eh, if we're in perfection, we're in unity, right? So we're, this is still ongoing and on uh, chapter 19, going on to perfection, number 19, diligently obey Yahweh by doing the works of Abraham. And yes, Abraham paid tithes. And yes, Abraham paid third tithes. And yes, Yahshua paid third tithes and taught others to do so. But this is on page 163 in your Israel Says programs, which praise Yahweh. We have that now at our fingertips a lot of us here, and, you know, that, that's the only righteous use or one of the few righteous uses other than the communication aspect, the direct communication in this work uh, of these devices here. And you can now get this and read this in that program. But in this sermon here, Pastor goes into detail showing the love. I'll just read a few verses here. Uh, this is on page 165. It says, Pastor tells us, Yahshua shows us what true love is. Yahweh shows what love is, and He tells you not only to love your brother, but He tells you how to love your brother. And this is where it becomes hard. But I've never told you that it would be anything but hard. You've got to be tried, and then you've got to suffer persecution for doing Yahweh's laws. So no, it's not, not easy. Pastor told us years ago that getting into this kingdom is the hardest thing any person can ever do. But with the tools and the food that we have, it is doable. It's very doable. Matter of fact, for us, there is simply no excuse other than our own stubborn pride that we just read about here and the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh that would keep us from coming to this perfection. This is a sign that Yahweh gives us that He is a true believer of Yahweh's laws. Yahshua didn't go around all over the world or around Israel hunting poor people and trying to buy groceries for them. No way. But He did keep and teach Yahweh's laws, including paying third tithe to bring the poor to the feast. You bring it all into the storehouse, the house of Yahweh. So Yahweh will have food in His house. And these are the means of helping people along with when He taught them the law. Not this Christian giving, Salvation Army type of attitude. You know, do you think the poor people ever get a dime out of that Salvation Army money? It's a joke. He says, I've never told you that paying tithes was easy or that getting into the kingdom would be easy. There are only a few who are going to make it. You can be one of those few if you will stop lusting after what you have to steal from Yahweh and start doing what He tells you. It's only a short time. 
Remember that, a short time. That's why I hit about the temporary dwellings, even our own bodies being a temporary dwelling that you have to prove yourselves to Yahweh, brethren. You won't always have the time to do this, uh, he says, and I'll be a witness against you. He says, you must not steal. This includes stealing the third tithes. Yes, it is set apart. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the lawgiver, the one who gave it to your trust, as all the earth is his. And he says in Psalm 24, 1, The earth is great Yahweh's and its fullness. Everything, yes. He does put us in charge of some things. Okay, so whatever it is you have in your possession or you're allowed to have in your possession, Yahweh has put you in charge of it. He does put us in charge to see if we can love our brother as ourselves, to test us, to see if we can obey his laws. And then it goes into uh, about the unrighteous mammon. And remember, this was one of the things. The, remember the young man. Let's turn over there. And Pastor fully describes it here in this chapter. I would that everybody please read this chapter, chapter 19 fully. But look at Matthew 19 real quick here. And remember the young man... And Pastor explains this fully in this sermon here. Look at verse 16. What righteous thing must I do that I may have eternal life? Well, or be in unity with Yahweh. That's the requirement for eternal life as we're striving for unity. But he said to him, why do you question me about righteousness? There is only one who is the standard of perfection. That is Yahweh. So if you would enter into life, Keep the laws of Yahweh. This is which ones? You know, can you pick and choose? No. Yahshua said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you now shall not bear false testimony, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your brother as yourself. Do you know when you steal third tithes? You break every one of those of the Ten Commandments that Yahshua read. Because he's talking about third ties to this young man. He says, all these things I have kept from my youth up. What do I yet lack? If you want to come to the perfection of Yahweh, in verse 21, he didn't, the, the King James says, oh, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Well, that would mean his clothes, too. So then he'd be standing there on the corner naked and somebody else would have to sell everything they have and give it to him. Do you see the foolishness of Christianity there? He says, and we have it right here in the book of Yahweh, sell of what you have and give your third tithe for the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Remember where your heart is, there your treasure is and vice versa. Where your treasure is. There your heart is. Is your heart in the kingdom? Or is it in a temporary p pile of money or bank account that's going to burn up here in a very short time? But when the young man heard that saying, he went away in sorrow, for he had great possessions. And I'm sure he was going to take them all into the kingdom with him. No way, brothers and sisters. Strive for this eternal kingdom. Live like they, and put it in your heart. Like Pastor said about uh, eating under the sukkah. Try to remember that this is a temporary life and it's only our obedience to Yahweh that's going to gain us this eternal life in perfect unity with Yahweh. With that, if everyone will please stand. It's now my great honor and privilege to turn the services over to the great Kohan, Ilya Hawkins. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. You may all be seated. Of course, remembering, bringing to remembrance what Yahshua said in Matitia 24, never let that slip your mind about what the choices of man are bringing in today's society with earthquakes, disease, rumors of wars, and of course the love of many has grown and is still growing cold. Well, we're going to start off in California looking at the drought that is getting worse and worse, and there's two things to get from this. One is there, there's a dam that is cracked, and of course they drain it. The company owns the water supply there, and they're draining that, but they think they leave two weeks' worth of water so they can harvest the fish. 
only to go back the next day and find out all the water has evaporated or it has disappeared, as they're saying. Well, one, the water is short, and two, they don't have the knowledge to even manage what minimal water supply they have. It's a self-destructing atmosphere or environment we see in California. And remember, as goes California, so goes the rest of the world. And then we have in Florida a man who's trying to stop these deadly attacks. And of course, what other way to do it when you go the way of Cain than create a Crusader's machine gun? And he has it set up so you can set your safety switch to not fire, of course, his piece, to fire a single shot is war, and to put it on fully automatic is the God, it says God wills it. That's what's on the machine gun, and he wants these things to combat Muslims, to fight another religion, himself, of course, being a devout Christian. And then looking over to the refugees, remember all of this traumatic trauma these refugees have been through, nobody has wanted them. This is very important. Remember the words, Arab Peace Initiative. This was endorsed in 2003 by the Quartet. You will no longer hear the Quartet called Quartet. It is called the Quartet Plus. What that plus represents is it represents Arab nations, and it's this Arab Peace Initiative that they're bringing in. That's why you see Egypt and Jordan. But to get back to these refugees, why did no one want these refugees in? Well, you're going to see a woman who you've seen a lot of here lately, Frederica Mogherini, and she is literally yelling at the EU in a meeting because she wants money. They need money to take care of these refugees. Because according to the initiative, if refugees flee their homeland, they are to be compensated. In other words, they need to be fed. They need housing. These countries don't want that. That's what they were fighting so hard against. But this Arab Peace Initiative is being used along with what the quartet is doing. They're not silent at all, so pay close attention to what you see. And then, of course, France started bombing Syria. They have been bombing Iraq, but they started bombing Syria. France did only for Syria the next day to say, you know, we know they're bombing us, but you would think they would ask our permission first. You would think they would ask us, where should you be bombing? Well, France doesn't want Assad in rulership. And that's the disagreement that we've seen at the Ununited Nations this week. That's what the UN stands for, Ununited Nations, where you have leaders, you have Vladimir Putin of Russia, and of course you have the Chancellor of Germany, Hussein Assad, needs to say, remember, Germany does a lot of trade with Russia. They need to be friends with Russia. France, on the other hand, is saying Assad needs to go. But now you have Russia, you have, you, you have uh, France, and you have the United States, and they're all bombing Syria, but they don't agree on the solution. So you see a lot of tensions building. Now remember, Syria is an 87% Muslim nation. It's a Muslim nation, so if we're fighting to save Christians, why has over half the population been displaced? It's because it's a war on religion. It's a war fighting against a religion. And of course, Israel has also gotten involved in bombing Syria this week, dropping bombs around the Gaza Strip, bombing Syria, and of course saying that it's a retaliation for what was done to them. And then in Russia, if you remember back when Pope Francis, there were many leaders coming to him, and the leader of Bahrain presented this model of a Catholic cathedral that they were going to build in their country. Well, Vladimir Putin offered something to the Pope this week also. It is the largest mosque in Europe, and they are displaying it with great pleasure, and this is a slap in the Catholic Church's face because it's being displayed, Putin says, to show how Muslims are not this a radical kind of belief that is being portrayed that they are. It will house 10,000 worshipers, and many from the Arab nations, including Mahmoud Abbas, came to at the dedication of this mosque that is going to be shown, and it is huge. It, it overshadows the Dome of the Rock in Israel. And then last but not least, of course, Pope Francis, which we will get to much more this week, kissing babies and parents letting their children come up to the Pope as he blessed them. Now, of course, this is what you see, but we also bring into what Pastor had talked about with Scott Paley of CBS News, who was saying that what would have occurred at World War II if they would have had iPhones and been able to upload videos? Well, as you see the Pope kissing babies with one hand, of course, you're going to see, and whatever you do, don't turn your heads. Pay close attention. See the Pope. See this religion for what it is 
as children in Syria are sarin gassed and they vomit. They go into convulsions. They die horrible deaths. And I mean horrible deaths. And if you think he's going to kiss these babies and make them better, you're greatly deceived. There's nothing but death behind what this man is doing. And at this time, if we could go ahead and play the news. Pay close attention. What you're about to see is Bible prophecy being fulfilled. Welcome to another edition of YPN News, bringing you news as it relates to Bible prophecy and foretold by Yisro Hawkins, uh, where we have some graphic images of war. Uh, France is joining in on airstrikes. Uh, the countries of the European Union are begging for money for migrants, and Israel is bringing forth some attacks on the Golan Heights. And these are just a few of the articles showing the results of the love grown cold throughout the world. Now we start off today with an interview on 60 Minutes Overtime. Scott Pelley discussed his decision to show graphic images of the atrocities of war, saying these things happen all too often in this world because people don't see them and don't know why sarin, referring to sarin gas attacks, is banned by almost every country on earth. He continued, we wanted the world to see what this was in all its ugliness. It killed more than a thousand people, over 400 children. People can read about that all day, but if you don't see it, I don't believe the impact truly hits you. Yeah. Now, in an interview, the statement was made concerning how times have changed in reporting war crimes. Pelle responded, what would have happened during the Holocaust if all the Jews had cell phones? Well, certainly the world would have found out much sooner uh, than what was happening. Uh, we've never seen anything like the sarin gas attacks in Damascus, and he emphasized the word seen and the fact that these atrocities happen and keep happening because we don't see it take place. Now, a reservoir in Northern California all of a sudden ran dry, killing thousands of fish and leaving residents scratching their heads for answers. The reservoir called Mountain Metal, also known as Walker Lake, uh, residents were just fishing at the lake a Saturday before, and by the following Saturday, it drained like a bathtub. Mm. And by the next day on Sunday, it looked pretty parched. Now, the smell is awful, said one resident who lived next to the lake all his life. And this is the first time he's ever seen the lake run dry. Oh, I bet thousands and thousands of fish just lying on there, rotting in the sun. That's got to be difficult to tolerate. Uh, Pacific Gas and Electric owns the rights to the water and uses it for hydroelectric power. Paul Moreno, a spokesman for PG&E, said it's a situation we worked hard to avoid. But uh, the situation is we're in a very serious drought. And we're also concerned for the fish downstream. He also said there should have been at least two more weeks of water left, and that would have given them enough time to relocate the fish. Obviously, that was not the case. Now, while some residents think that PG&E just opened the dam and let all the water out, officials at the plant say that wasn't the case. The water simply just dried up. In fact, Doug Carlson with the Department of Water Resources said, all the reservoirs across the region are drying up. And Catan, of course, that's got to be a concern for the residents of California because they're already in this drought and now they're having more reservoirs drying up. That's right. Pretty frustrating situation over there. Well, in Syrian news, a Syrian watchdog has reported that the United States has sent 75 more U.S. trained rebels into Syria. They were trained in the program that we recently reported uh, was based in Turkey, and that program has a $500 million budget. Uh, despite such an enormous budget, the results are disappointing, and many uh, they're disappointing many on Capitol Hill, especially since there's only a handful of those soldiers that are actually trained or have completed that training that being nine Ooh. of 54. So these are another group of soldiers, but, uh, but the training program that was supposed to 
produce these $500 million men, so to speak, hasn't done so. Well, U.S. citizens are also wanting to do their part to fight terrorism here and abroad. One such Florida arms dealer modified an assault rifle with the purpose of no Muslim being able to fire it. Hmm. He named his new weapon the Crusader. Oh, that's interesting. Now, the Crusader is designed with Christian symbols on them, crosses and so forth, uh, with the hopes of stopping uh, Muslims from using them to target Christians. The owner said, I want a gun where if a Muslim terrorist grabbed hold of it, and these are his words, a bolt of lightning knocks him dead on the spot. Well, I don't know how that would occur, but he even had Bible verses engraved on the weapons. One such verse is Psalms 144.1, and he says his message is to remind people that the Christian crusaders save the world from darkness by defeating the Muslim army. Hmm. Now, Katana, if you remember properly, Yisrael Hawkins has taught us through the historical references that the Crusades were actually initiated by the Catholic Church. And mm-hmm. history has it the other way around. Right. They say that the Christians were the one targeted, but actually the Christians were targeting those people that had any form of holiness, meaning mm-hmm. they followed some of the laws written in the Bible. Right. And they were the ones, these Crusades, that brought about the darkness on, on the world. Yeah, uh, a totally different story. Wow. Well, the rifle has three settings. Peace, which is safety and the gun won't fire. Uh, War, which is one bullet every time you squeeze the trigger. And God wills it, which is, of course, the fully automatic function. Well, Well, Brussels is demanding money from EU members to assist with refugees coming from the Middle East. Now to the U.N. agencies, 1 billion euros has been pledged to those groups working in the region. In fact, the issue of money has been a sensitive one for the EU states, so much so the EU's foreign policy chief, Frederica Mogherini, showed anger when talking about the lack of contributions. Mm. Addressing EU members, she said Germany is contributing by 5 million euros, Italy is contributing by 3 million euros, and that's it. We have to start being consistent. She later apologized for getting emotional and added, sometimes we need it. In addition to providing aid for asylum seekers, EU countries are also responsible for providing benefits to the refugees as well. In Europe, refugees are offered 200 euros per month plus housing. In Germany, they get about 140 euros while welcome centers take care of their food and housing. But in France, they get up to 718 euros per month, depending on their family size. While Western European states were pleased with the results of the summit, Eastern states like Hungary were far from optimistic about the outcome. Viktor Orban, Hungary's prime minister, said, We have been unable to reach an agreement on defending the Greek borders together if Greece is unable to do it alone. This is a shame, as it is the most important of all the proposals. He continued, in this sense, Europe's external border is still not protected and the migrants breaking international agreements continue to come through Greece. Well, recently, more than 10,000 refugees entered Hungary, mostly through Croatia, which is a new record. After Hungary closed its borders with Serbia, thousands of refugees went to Croatia instead. And as a result, the Croatian government started busing them to the Hungarian border. The majority of refugees are trying to make it to Western Europe. They're not even interested in staying in Hungary. They're just using it as a throughway. But Hungary is saying, no no way, way. find another route. Well, continuing our coverage, Larry, it appears that uh, another country has joined the fight against ISIL. Who is it this time? And can you give us an update on the rest of the countries that are fighting the Islamic State? France is the latest nation to lend its military arm to the increasing roster of nations somehow involved in the conflict in Syria. The latest attack by the French was executed against ISIS in coordination with what's being called France's regional partners and comes on the heels of its recent decision to expand its bombings in Iraq. A U.S.-led coalition force is performing strikes in both Iraq and Syria, but the French have chose to limit their efforts to the Iraqi region. 
analysts have so far labeled the campaign a failure, with political leaders such as George Jabut, the president of the Syrian UN Association, commenting further yet that the activities of France have been a violation of international law. According to Jabut, the French should have coordinated their efforts with the Syrian government, since it is the Syrian government that is the legitimate government of the country whose governing authority and sovereignty is recognized by the UN. But of course, the association president said, we know that the UN is not active in protecting Syrian sovereignty at this time. Meanwhile, ISIS insurgents are quickly advancing on the Kurdish border town of Kobani. Video is now circulating on the internet demonstrating the intensity of the fighting, with ISIS militants making every effort, according to reports, to remove all traces of the Syrian Kurds who occupy the town. This includes removing images of their leadership, with the result that yet another mass of thousands of people have been forced to flee Syria in search for peace and safety. From Turkey, refugees confirmed that they were being attacked by ISIS insurgents. It's a war out there, they say. They were advancing, so we had to flee. Our children are devastated and starving. While willing to help, Turkish officials are said to be concerned that the crisis will only get worse. What does appear to be getting better, however, is international opinion for President Assad. This week, many European officials began softening their stance on the embattled leader, including German Chancellor Angela Merkel, who says that President Assad must be involved in any talks aimed at ending the conflict in Syria. Shockingly, the chancellor of Europe's largest economy also stated that Iran and Saudi Arabia are important regional partners which Berlin needs to talk to concerning the crisis in Syria. The Russian bear is apparently already making strides in that direction. At a press conference this week, Russian and Iranian officials announced a collective intention to work closely together to find solutions to the violent conflicts currently raging throughout the region of the Tigris and Euphrates. Iran's deputy minister was recently in Moscow to consult with Russia's deputy foreign minister concerning a peace plan which Iran has proposed for Syria. The Iranian minister expressed loyalty on behalf of both nations for the legitimate and democratically elected government of Syria and pledged to use all of its means to help Damascus to come out of its crisis. The duo also expressed concern over the chaos mounting in Yemen, and while Tehran is not currently militarily involved in the conflict, it is said to be providing aid to countries facing serious threats of terror. For IPN News, I'm Larry McGee. Katan Jeff, back to you. Well, after all these talks, it still doesn't seem like the nations are set towards truly achieving peace, except through their own means, which appears to be war, continual war. Well, as we continue our coverage in and around the Great River Euphrates, Israel has launched airstrikes and artillery attacks on Syrian army posts. The Israeli government said these attacks are in response to rocket fire from the Golan Heights. Uh, four rockets landed in the upper Galilee region in the Israeli-occupied parts of the Golan Heights. No one was injured in the rocket attacks. However, several fires were started as a result. Israel has been accused of backing militants fighting against the Syrian government. Well, after spending 10 years rebuilding, Russia's biggest mosque has reopened in Moscow with several Middle East leaders attending the event. The mosque is now one of the largest in Europe and can accommodate 10,000 worshipers. The opening ceremony was attended by presidents of Russia, Turkey, Palestine, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, and Kyrgyzstan, as well as ambassadors from several countries. The president of the Council of Muftis uh, of Russia, Rawil Ganyitun stressed the importance of the event. This is a historic moment that will strengthen peace and brotherhood between countries, peoples, and cultures. We are grateful to all who helped to build this mosque. Well, at the opening ceremony, short speeches were delivered by the presidents of Russia, Turkey, and Palestine. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas condemned Israel aggression against his people and called on the international community to, ins to ensure the protection of Muslims and Palestinian Christians in Jerusalem and other holy sites by saying, we strongly condemn any act of occupation by the Israeli authorities to prohibit access to the holy mosque Al-Aqsa. And if you remember, Katan, they just had all that fighting take place mm -hmm. there. So, of course, that's still fresh on everyone's mind. That's right. 
Well, Russian President Vladimir Putin also spoke at the big event. From my heart, I congratulate you all, he said, for the opening of the renovated Moscow Mosque. This is a great event from four Russian Muslims. The Russian president continued, we can see what's happening in the Middle East now, where terrorists from the so-called Islamic State compromise the great world religion of Islam by killing people. Their ideology is based on lies, on the obvious distortion of Islam. All leaders that attended the event seem to stress that this new mosque has a role to play, that it must support and preach true Islamic values and combat more extreme interpretations that are coming forth from groups like Islamic State. Now, many feel Moscow is becoming a headquarters when it comes to fighting ISIS. Russia has been pushing the idea that there needs to be a radical change and everybody needs to come together into a huge coalition against the Islamic State. Interesting. Well, the Russian president is not the only one that shares these beliefs. After a U.N. summit in New York, Egypt's president says the states in the Middle East need to cooperate to defeat increasing threats from extremists. Abdel Fattah el-Sisi told the Associated Press the terrorist threats has led to a furious war in Egypt. The 60-year-old former military chief who assumed office in 2014 after the army ousted his predecessor, Mohamed Morsi, said every country needs to put in a lot of effort in order to improve security and stability in the Middle East. President al-Sisi covered a wide range of issues in the interview, saying Syria should not be divided or partitioned and that he is optimistic about creating peace between Israel and the Palestinians. The president also spoke about the need to stabilize and rebuild countries that are sliding into a vicious cycle of failure. And all of that, Katan, as a result, like he mentioned, because of the wars that are taking place, you know, his country is uh, suffering greatly as well. That's right, that ripple effect. Of Absolutely. The right. Well, lastly in the news, Pope Francis. Pictures from the Pope's recent visit to the United States continue to surface. Images of the leader of the world's religions waving at crowds, trying to get as close as he can to the people that admire him the most, the Catholic Church. Well, called by many the people's Pope, Pope Francis can be seen wherever he goes, kissing babies and calling the lame and diseased to his presence. However, no amount of kissing and waving of hands can help those men, women, and children who are suffering from the wars and results of those wars waging in the world today. As CBS anchorman Scott Pelley said, you can read about these terrible things all day, but if you don't see it, the impact truly doesn't hit you. Israel Hawkins, overseer of the House Yahweh, has said that the only way to stop all wars is to teach the laws of peace found in the Holy Scriptures. So as Pope Francis is saying, who am I to judge? Israel Hawkins says, judge for yourself. See if the choices mankind is making is bringing peace to this earth. No amount of outward flattery will change the hearts and minds of mankind. As Israel Hawkins says, only through the education of moral laws will mankind have peace. Now to see for yourself the deadly effects of war, check out the 60, 60 Minutes program entitled A Crime Against Humanity. And to see for yourself the effects of righteousness and the teachings thereof, check out the House of Yahweh. Contact them today, request your free prophetic word magazine and monthly newsletter. You can also download hundreds of sermons given by Yeshua Hawkins, packed full of information that is guaranteed to leave you saying, wow. Well, to contact the House of Yahweh, you can write them at the House of Yahweh, P.O. Box 2498, Abilene, Texas, 79604. You can call them at 1-800-613-9494. Visit them on any of their websites at www.yahweh.com, www.yeshrohawkins.com, or www.yahwehsbranch.com. You can also check out our new website at www.ypnnews.com. And to email the House of Yahweh, send your emails to info at Yahweh.com. And for any calls outside the United States, please call the number on your screen. We'll grab a notebook and a pen or pencil. Up next is Yeshua Hawkins. From all of us here at YPN News, I'm Jeffrey Heimerman. And I'm Katana Alexander. Thanks for watching.
this time, if everyone would please stand, I would like to introduce the Malak who Yahshua Messiah said he has sent to the house of Yahweh to testify of these things. The greatest teacher in the world, the great Kahan Yisrael, Abel Hawkins. Shalom, everyone. Hand over. Look at this. Wow. Oh, you're a beautiful sight. <laughs> you may be seated. <clears throat> may the peace of Yahweh be with each and every one of you. We got a full house, I see. Uh, we'll be expanding the sanctuary soon. <laughs> Praise Yahweh. <laughs> the uh, book of Israel. Uh, part 2, 14, isn't it? 14, part 2. 14 means, means, I bet Kohan, Benjamin, Krauss, Hawkins would know. It means consent. Consent. And then 2, right to Father Yahweh. 2 is Father Yahweh. Consent, 14. To Father Yahweh, and then book two, when you look up 14, that means to do righteousness. <laughs> Isn't that something? <laughs> Praise Yahweh. <laughs> but you got to do it. You got to do it. Not just, uh, not just look, but you got to do it. Um, my bread sacks this morning, an additional sacrifice must be offered every day of the feast. Uh, of Tabernacles, 20, uh, Numbers 29, 12, and 13. Remember the oblation now that you give. That, that can mean teaching, helping, assistance, assisting. Dad used to teach us to assist our mother in everything she needs you to do. <laughs> and listen to what she said. He said, I've never been sorry of that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Praise Yahweh. The other bread sack. Yisrael is not teasing. <laughs> Yisrael is not teasing. Get this, uh, uh, Michael. Also, sound like a song. Israel is not teasing when he says, Yahweh's eyes, in Yahweh's eyes, we must be pleasing. We are striving for unity. To become a holy community, we must overcome before they drop the nuclear bomb. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> the women wrote that. <laughs> that is beautiful. <laughs> I didn't mean to get off on that note. Okay. <laughs> Uh, let's see. High priest over the house of Yahweh, Yahshua is, and he's been put in charge to behold the house of Yahweh. That means watching over continually, teaching, guarding, guiding, protecting the, pro pro the protected place. He says, the gates of hell will not prevail against it this time. Now, all of his words have come to pass so far to the point to where we even have the nuclear bomb that can darken the sun. We've never had that before. There's a peaceful scene set up here at the end of the, at the south end of the sanctuary, down by the south office, close to it. And, and uh, to the east of that now, we have a huge green tent that's going to be filled with things that non-electric. <laughs> there was no electric <laughs> in, in, in my house until I was, I think, nine or ten years old, maybe twelve. Uh, it was a long time after I was born. We read with kerosene lights. You'll see some of those there, lanterns and, and the kerosene lamp. But you'll see cooking instruments and... and uh, butter-making machines and 
uh, milk separators, all run by hand. Uh, now, that, that was just 81 years ago. And that's when also the automobile came into action uh, with this same increase in knowledge. The planes that we have today that people uh, go to and, and uh, they dress you down naked and take a, a picture of you uh, 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 exposing everybody's nakedness that goes on a plane now. Uh, of course, this is Satan's world. This is the fun thing to do, they think, the desirable things to do. They thought that in, in Cain's day, too, and all the world is following Cain today in continual war and fighting. Uh, yes, that's what it's about. Continual war and fighting. Take what you want. Don't ask for it. Just take it. <laughs> and, and, of course, uh, kill the person who objects to it. Well, that, that's the way, the way of the world today. And, of course, it's bringing evil. It's bringing war, sickness, disease, fighting in this generation. And he says, for the elect's sake, though, so you can see how he's got his mind upon you. He's beholding you, the elect, the very elect that Yahweh chose. You know, Yahshua said to the Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, and Herodians, he said, no one can come unto me unless the Spirit of the Father draw him. Well, the Spirit of the Father is the laws of Yahweh. That's the Spirit of the Father. And unless you got your mind on those laws, the only thing that could bring you here would be something on your own, evil of uh, your own. Maybe you just tagged along with somebody else, but you don't really have your mind upon the laws. Uh, you're exposing yourself to eternal damnation for this if you don't get to study on those laws because they're put before you. And if you beg Yahshua, through Yahshua, beg Yahweh, he might go ahead and call you the, and, and let that spirit of his draw you into understanding Yahweh's way and the plan and the, and the opportunity, the opportunity of of uh, receiving righteousness from Yahweh. Uh, not evil, not fighting, not, uh, not leaving uh, your post, your house, your, uh, your children, uh, not forsaking them. I don't remember my mother ever forsaking her children. They were the uppermost thing in her mind. And, and uh, Dad played his part. He pushed forward Mother. As Yosef did Mary... Remember who found Yahshua and corrected him, corrected the Savior? I know you remember that. <laughs> he said, I must be about my father's work, my father's business. And she said, well, you need to take care of me first. So he went with her and he took care of her till Yahweh put him back in Jerusalem, talking to the Pharisees, Sadducees, and Essene. Who did he obey there? The words of his mother. His father didn't have anything to say. <laughs> well, anyway, honor your mother. Honor your father also, but honor your mother. She's teaching you from the very little bitty thing you were to begin with to what you are now. <laughs> Remember her words always. That's what the great uh, wisdom in the Holy Scriptures, Proverbs and Ecclesiastes teaches you. Remember this great wisdom that came from her. She wasn't just correct correcting you because, you know, she wanted to. It was correcting you because she wanted to get you into the kingdom. She wanted you to grow up righteous. That's the reason you need to take her advice. And he says to all the tall men, I don't care how, how great you think yourself is, you think yourselves are, bend down and listen, give an ear, to that one you think is below you? Now this is the oblation that you can offer every day here at this feast. Every day. Keep it in mind as you keep this great unity with Yahweh. Look on over now to verse 23. Then if any man says to you, behold, he, here is the Messiah. Or he is here, or he is there. Do not believe it, he said. Did you get that? Do not believe it. Well, where did he say he was? <laughs> he says, 
Yahshua himself said, Seek Yahweh and his righteousness. Deuteronomy 12 said, Seek his habitation. Isaiah 2 and Micah 3 both say in the last days it'll be established in the chief of the nations. In the chief of the nation. And, and, and Isaiah, Yekiska, uh, Yeremia all call this the protected place. So does Psalms 91, where they keep the feast of Yahweh. That's the protected place. Now, they're going to try to get you to stop this. <laughs> I'm going to show you that this feast, they're going to try to persuade you here in the United States not to come to the feast anymore. And they're going to mark you as a, uh, a heretic, a heretic deserving of death. Well, you're already the lowest scum on the face of the earth in their eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Fear not those who can kill the body, but can't kill this spirit that's going to, that you're going to be found wearing when you're resurrected. This spirit, this garment, this white garment that Yahshua spoke of. That's the one that's going to identify you as belonging to Yahweh. And then even if you're killed, you won't be dying anymore once you're resurrected. You won't have that second death hanging over you. But be, be set to be strong. It's coming. This man wasn't here for, for, uh, with, without a reason. You know, this has been going on for, for thousands of years now, this rebellion. And, it, and Yahweh said they rejected him. So he said, that's all right. I'll take my kingdom from you. Do you get that? I'll take my kingdom from you. And I'm going to give it to somebody else. You go ahead and go your way, since you've rejected me, you've killed my prophets, you even killed my son, so I'm going to take the kingdom from you and I'm going to give it to someone else. Well, that was a prophecy long before they killed his son. He even prophesied to them, this is what you're going to do. And then, and then, but they were fools for not believing him. Fools for not believing what the prophets spoke. That's what Yahshua said. You can't. You can't give prophecy on your own. Try to, tell your, try to tell your children and your wife or your husband or your children what is going to take place next week. <laughs> I, I can't tell you, you can't do it. You, you, can't even t you don't even know what's going to take place tonight for sure. Or today, it could happen to you today. You know, you just can't predict it. But Yahweh's prophets can. Yahweh can. And he can expose the evil that's coming forth and warn you of it. And that's what he, that's what he told our ancestors. Not all of them ref refused Yahweh. You know, Yahweh showed Zebulun saw the light. You know, they said, well, can a prophet come forth from, from Galilee? There's no place in the scripture that says a prophet can come forth from Galilee. They didn't have sense enough to look at the word Zebulon. They had to look at the word Galilee and prophet. But <laughs> had they looked, looked at the word Zebulon, they'd have saw that a prophet's going to come forth from Galilee. <laughs> but they, had, they don't know the scriptures. The Pope don't know the scriptures. All he knows how to do is pretend. Pretend. Pretend that he can even read. He can't read hardly. You know, our children can outdo him. But that's what the world is falling for, is a, is a man who kisses babies, pretends he's righteous while he does no righteousness, but then he did admit, he did admit that what they're doing to the children is evil. That's a God of evil. <laughs> a little bit. He, he repented a little. We got that much out of him as he is coming down the steps out of his plane. Or maybe he's going to kiss another baby. Well, here in, in, in uh, verse 24 now, he says, For there will arise false messiahs and false prophets uh, who will sow signs, great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. If it were possible. Well, <laughs> What's going to keep you from being deceived? It's practicing righteousness. 
practicing righteousness. Let's go over to Revelations 12 and 13. I won't cover all of this right now. I intend to during the feast, but I want to show you some things right here that you can expect because this is the beast. And we see here the male son in chapter 12. We see uh, uh, the, uh, the, the woman uh, that brings forth the son. We see this beastly system waiting to kill him. All of this is shown here, and it, and it uh, agrees with the prophecies. If I had time right now, I would sock all that into your minds. Every one of these verses actually shows what a prophet said earlier. And verse 5 says, And she brought forth the male son who, who was to rule all nations. Well, if you remember, you remember where that's found? Clear back in Genesis 49. Genesis 49 is where that's found. And, and she brought this, this uh, uh, forth, not speaking, of course, of a woman, although a woman brought this man forth. She gave birth to the man. But the woman that brought him forth was called Zebulon, who saw the light, <laughs> who had a house of Yahweh in Galilee established by Abel. And all of these things are shown there, and they were still, still saying, if you want the answer, ask at Abel. But the Pope don't know how to do that because he's never read the scriptures. He's speaking sometimes what people tell him. Well, there's some, con, uh, some misconceptions in the book of Genesis. There's no misconceptions. It's misunderstanding on your part because you haven't studied at the place where one was sent from Yahweh to teach. <laughs> that's the only mix-up. <laughs> and that's the reason you're still deceived and you will be deceived until you start practicing righteousness the first step is coming to the house of Yahweh. And of course, the spirit, the law, tells you, go to the house of Yahweh, right? <laughs> go to the house of Yahweh. That's the first law. To the one sin. Yachanan, 6.29. 6.29, that's a great number. <laughs> you, you really need to latch on to that number. <laughs> We're going to be uh, covering some of that during the feast. I have a man assigned to do this. It's wonderful. We have young priests that has been studying into these. They have come up so, with some delightful things for you to listen to. Uh, I was so delighted to hear this that their, their interest just really perked up when they started studying these numbers to see what Yahweh was revealing in Hidden. It was hidden from the world, the entire world. They had, they had it in front of them, but couldn't understand it. There's a movement out now trying to pretend that there's a second Genesis somewhere. <laughs> yeah, it's over there. And no, no, it's over here. I forgot. No, they changed it. It's out yonder. Out yonder. You know. Over yonder, someone beckoned to me. <laughs> Over yonder, what pope could it be? <laughs> I changed that up just a little bit. <laughs> well, uh, the the people that rejected him, our forefathers, he said, "I'm going to take the kingdom from you, and I'm going to give it to someone else." And they will bring forth the fruit of it. The, you have to go to the, to the prophets to find out where that kingdom is. How it was set up, who would set it up, the one sent, and so forth. But it's all there. The Pope could get this from the program. The Israel Says Program. <laughs> Brethren, there has never been a study a scriptural study tool that would get anywhere equal to this. Not the con <laughs> praise y'all. Not the concordances. We have children that can actually look up questions and answer these. You know, very small children that can actually 
go into a computer or their telephone, their iPhone or whatever it is they used. I can't because I don't have a computer phone. I don't intend to get one. <laughs> I don't have time for it. Where, where I spend 16 to 18 hours of my day every day, you know, is with this book of Yahweh. I love it. <laughs> I respect it. I don't let anything, if somebody says something on top of my book of Yahweh, I quickly correct them. Don't ever cover your book of Yahweh with anything unless it would be your talit, the 613 laws. Now, you can cover it with, with that, but nothing else. Don't hide it, ever, except by putting the laws out there that that brings forth. Respect it, and, and it will respect you. Yes, it's made up of microorganisms, you know. That's right. They're on every page. Those, those tools you're reading there are captured microorganisms. Yes. And placed in on paper, which is microorganisms, that Yahweh also created. Yes. <laughs> They're alive. They won't move. You can smear them with dirt and everything like that, like I have mine from the fingerprints, and they get to where you barely read them, but I wear them plumb out before, before I put them in the box here. <laughs> They're worn pretty much out. Well, Yeshua is showing here, you know, that only those who practice righteousness is going to be undeceivable. Now, that's what he's showing you. And he says, you know, he says, except for you, everyone in the world is going to be deceived. Those who practice righteousness. If you look to chapter 21 there, um, we're, oh no, we're in Revelations. Let's, uh, let's cover a little more of this. The male child that they killed. Well, first they killed the prophets, if you remember. They persecuted and killed the prophets. And that's shown again in, in uh, Acts 7. You have to go back to and read or familiarize yourself with the prophets before you'll ever know how this persecuting them and what they were persecuting them for. Like Uremia and, and, and uh, the place he lived, Anathroth. And, he, and they t said to him in Anathroth, don't prophesy in the name of Yahweh anymore or we're going to kill you. Well, of course, in Yahshua, almost everything he taught them, they would start seeking a way to kill him. And that, that was the son of Yahweh, prophesied son of Yahweh. Well, here in verse, uh, uh, verse 10 of chapter 12, he says, And I heard a loud voice saying, In heaven now is come salvation and strength. What, what, what would you mean? Pump up your muscles, right? Uh, eat some super antibiotics or something and pump them up. The strength. You wouldn't know what that was unless you knew what the prophet said your strengths was. Eliyah, remember? Eliyah. And, and then Yahshua said, also back that up and says, I'm going to send you the law and the prophets just before the end. And it will turn. It has the strength of Yahweh to turn the hearts to the mothers and fathers and children. Turn the hearts. Well, the strength of Yahweh. Now is come salvation and strength. That is the laws or with. Take that and out and put by in its place. Here comes salvation by strength and of the kingdom. Strength of the kingdom of our father. Because it's the laws of the kingdom. And the power of his Messiah that he has already, uh, that's... Uh, the authority should have been authority instead of power. Authority that he is now uh, qualified for. Qualified for the power of Yahweh. And he carries that right now. And Yahweh says that he has power right now to behold the house of Yahweh and protect the house of Yahweh to keep this work going through this great tribulation, and then resurrect, resurrect now, get this, don't worry about dying, resurrect all of those who do die. 
and have died. And that's the authority you're going to have. It's worth, it's worth buckling under and doing everything you have to do to acquire it. And what you have to do is a pra- practice, of course, you always wait. Now, he, she is, verse 13, he says, And when the dragon saw that she was cast out uh, to, unto the earth, she persecuted the woman uh, which brought forth the man. Well, I want you to skip on down now to Re- Revelations 13. Because he shows the first beast here that came up out of the earth where there was multitudes, nations, and tongues. You got that? Revelations 12. Come on, pay attention to me now. Revelations 13, uh, 1 through 10, shows you this first beast that came up out of the earth where there's multitudes, nations, and tongues. That was in the very area now, right now, where we saw this morning all the hell breaking loose. Wars and fighting, men, women, and children being killed along with the buildings all destroyed uh, 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 with uh, bombs and poison gases and everything they can think of to hit each other with. They've taken peace from the earth as Revelation said they would. They took peace from the earth in our time period. The quartet did. The quartet is the one that took it away And they're given orders by the Vatican to do this and hurt not the oil or the wine. And that's took place in our time, in our in in just the few years that we opened the door and started it to going. We had turned it loose and let the wars begin. We did it. It's in the book of Israel. Look it up. (laughs) Praise Yahweh. Now, here, this 13, then, uh, it, it shows you in the first part of it, this beast that rises up. And notice what the blasphemy, that's uh, against the name. Uh, verse 5, and there was given unto him a mouth. The Vatican gives it to the Pope. He gives this mouth to the Pope. The Pope is the spokesman that gets up here and reads like this. And and mince, and. and of course, he reads in Latin, so you don't know what he's saying. And someone else tells us what he was supposed to have said. It sounds like, the, I don't know Latin, but it sounds like they're adding a few extra words <laughs> sometimes. But, but this is the man, this is the mouth that comes forth and delivers messages from the Vatican. They won't talk by phone because they, the others would pick it up. The enemies would pick this up. They don't talk by computer. They don't send messages, period. When they get ready to take a message, they send the Pope to Congress, to the United States, to Egypt, to Russia. The only way we knew what the Pope was talking about was Russia. They never let us know. But Putin says after he left, don't mess with our religion. Well, of course, this is what Malachi Martin said. All are going to die. Satan is going to make war against all of you people who will not worship her. Well, who is this? Who is this Mary they're talking about? It's not the righteous Mary of Yahshua, Miriam, but Mary, the queen of heaven that we see Jeremiah or Yeremia, Jeremiah, King James Version, Yeremia, book of Yahweh. Remember, the book of Yahweh was stolen from the temple, when they destroyed the temple, they took all the artifacts to Rome. I'm thinking now even the stones was removed to Rome, and they probably got it set up right now to where the Pope takes his seat in it. And, and, and it, it does look that way. It, that'd be hard to hide that many stones as big as those stones were. A- anyway, you could see them from, uh, from, uh, from the uh, uh, NASA. NASA could see this if they were there. They discover bodies of water. Why couldn't they discover stone? Well, I think, well, I don't have any proof for it right now. But we do have proof. We have history saying they took the book of Yahweh and they held it captive for 1917 years before it was reestablished in 1987 by the house of Yahweh. Yes. They, they took 
the kingdom away from themselves. Yahweh didn't do this, but he allowed them to. It's written as if Yahweh did it. Well, Yahweh had to allow it. That's the way he did it. But he allowed them to do this to themselves. He didn't hold it there. He could have held it there, but he didn't. He allowed them to do this because they can't come back later and say, well, we would have had peace if, we could, if you'd just have let us go our way. We could have brought peace and proved that we could bring peace. So he let them go fully his way with nothing restrained. But he says only to a time. I'll give you this much time until this. I'll do this until. And he said that in Daniel. I'll allow, allow this until. He did, he did this in other places too. But Daniel makes it. He spoke clearer in Daniel. Go back quickly to... Well, no, let's continue on here. They blasphemed Yahweh. They took away his name and power was given unto them, uh, uh, given unto him, that is the mouth, to make war for 42 moons. This is a serious war that will be cut short, the nuclear war that I suspect will start pretty quickly now. And he opened his mouth and blasphemed me against Yahweh to blaspheme his name the name Yahweh, you know, the hatred for Yahweh and Abilene, it's, it's enormous. Uh, and, and you wouldn't know it until the name is brought up. And, and of course, uh, when you see that, when the name Yahweh is brought up, a sour look comes on the person's face. I used to, I used to tell them, you know, they say, Yahweh? I said, yeah. You don't know the name Yahweh? No. I said, well, you, you should, really should get acquainted with him. He's your creator. Oh, he's not my creator. I've ha I had that said to me. He's not my creator. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, but Satan didn't create you. Satan wants to get rid of you. But he blasphemed his name and his house and those who dwell in heaven. We're the most hated, most hated people on the face of the earth right now. And I love it. And notice it was given unto him to make war with, uh, with the saints and to overcome them. Now this is still speaking of the first beast that, ro that rose up where there was multitudes, nations, and tongues. And on down here now in verse 11, we see what we're standing in right now, the United States. And we see this first beast here coming here to tell our government what to do. And he took them behind closed doors and he told them, he gave them the message from the Vatican. He's the mouthpiece for the Vatican, delivering a message. Verse 11, I saw another beast coming up out of the earth that has two horns. That's the Protestants and the Catholics and spoke like the dragon, like the dragon, not like Yahweh, not being in the likeness of Yahweh, but the likeness of the dragon, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. That's who it's speaking of. And that's what they're doing right now. They have, they're having, someone told me the other day they, that, uh, that uh, the mayor of Abilene was now telling the people to go to church on Sunday. Now, don't keep the fourth commandment of Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, but he's commanding them to go to church on Sunday. Go to church. Pick whatever church you choose and go to church. Well, we're not a church, so, you know, and he knows that. <laughs> but he did specify church, they said. I said, he actually told them to go to church on Sunday. Told them what day to go. Yep, that's what they said. And he, uh, uh, they said there was a movement. There's a big movement to do this now. To have the people, start commanding the people. Now, you, I guess using the city officials, uh, maybe the uh, Washington too, probably so. And uh, I didn't know it would work this fast. You know, the Pope was just here day before yesterday. And, and uh, so, but, I, but uh, you can see how fast this thing is going to work. 
And they got this big movement to start a Sunday church program to where they get all the people in the church on Sunday morning. On Sundays, not the Sabbath day, the seventh day of the week, but the first day of the week. That's not the commandment that Yahshua said, blessed are those who practice Yahweh's righteousness, who keep his commandments, the King James Version, keep his laws, says the book of Yahweh, for they have right to the tree of life. The people who keep Sunday do not have right to the tree of life. He spoke like the dragon, now likeness, in his likeness, in the likeness of the dragon, verse 12, and he exercised all the authority of the first beast before him and, and caused the earth and those that dwell upon the earth to worship the first beast, to serve. Remember, worship means to serve. That's in book one and book two of the book of Yahweh. Worship means serve. You belong to whom you obey, Romans 6, 16. And he does great wonders. This is the same thing that, that uh, Yahshua was talking about. He brings fire down from heaven. We're the first ones to do that. Uh, uh, Germany got pretty close to being the first ones, but no, we were the first ones to invent this, bringing this fire down from heaven and consuming cities. And notice verse 14, he deceives those who dwell upon the earth. Yeshua said this, this deception is going to go wild in this generation. If you remember, this is two horns here, and he's talking about deception. He deceives those who dwell upon the earth by those acts of power which they had, which he had authority to do in the sight. Notice he's given authority by, the, by Satan, the dragon, in the sight of of the beast in the sight of this first beast to, dwell, to, the, to deceive those that dwell upon the earth that they should make a likeness of the beast, to be in his likeness, in the God's likeness. Remember Genesis 3, 5, be like the gods, evil like the gods, be evil like the gods. So this is what this is talking about, likeness of the beast, which is following the gods. Uh, uh, which had the wound by the sword and did live. And he had power to give life to the likeness of the beast, uh, that the likeness of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the likeness of the beast should be killed. Now, if he could do that to the house of Yahweh, they would. But Yahweh said they won't. This is the protected place. Don't forget this, brethren. The protected place. They, you know, they're going to try to make out like they have power to protect you. And this is the only, this is the only thing that will save you is to join this beastly system. But if you join this beastly system, you will die with this beastly system. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive this mark in their right hand and in their forehead. I brought all of this before. I wanted to rehearse it here for the benefit of the next sermons that are to follow in, in, uh, throughout the feast. Come to learn. I hope you came to learn. I hope you came to practice too. Practice what you learn. <laughs> Praise Yahweh. You know, it's, it's going to be a wonderful feast, and you can make it that way if you, if, you, uh, if you will practice what you learn at this feast. You can make it a wonderful feast, or you can make it difficult. You could make it difficult. Um, uh, most people have trouble when their blood sugar is down, and they... They, they're hungry, they've worked all day, their lack of, uh, lack of food, or they didn't get the proper food the day before. Their body is not handling the food properly. I think that's the reason Yahshua said, cleanse yourselves inside. Cleanse yourselves inside. This is a, 
This is a great thing to do. The words of Yahshua, you know, you really need to practice those words. But when you get in a shape where your body is, is stirring up your emotions, it would be better sometimes if we kept our mouth shut at that time until you can get something in your body to give you the energy to control your mind. It'd just be better. <laughs> uh, you're weighted down with problems, I know. Uh, that's what I, t I promised you. I didn't promise you a bed of roses. <laughs> I promised you a garden of test, test and trials. <laughs> and I said, take these laws and practice them and it will make you perfect. And that's what the scripture shows from one end to the other. And then Yahshua, our great high priest and king over the house of Yahweh, says in Revelations 22, 14, blessed are those that do this, that practice these laws. Well, that's part of practicing the law. You know, to guard your, the mouth, to guard your mouth, because that's what's going to be, that's what's going to condemn you. Your mouth can condemn you for what you say. Don't say it. <laughs> Chew up them words, as this uh, elderly woman that I quoted one time, the elderly black woman, she says, well, I chew up my words before I spit them out. That way you'll always have friends. Build up your friends with kindness and mercy and thoughtfulness. Do, that, do your best to do this. If you go wrong, quickly, quickly repent. Quickly repent. And, and make up for it. But spend your life overcoming. Spend this time at the feast overcoming and helping others to overcome. May Yahweh bless you and I'll turn the services back to the next work. I love you. Praise. I love you.